Hi folks, Inder Varley here, uh, joined by Stevie, Stevie Porcher this week. Um, obviously, um, an, analysing the All-Ireland final the last, the last weekend, Dublin and Kerry. Um, Stevie, you're, you're at it. Um, what do you think? How, how's the form running? Yeah. What's the crack? Look, uh, not too bad, not too bad. Look, it's just, you know yourself, like the... The final is just a, it's a fantastic occasion. I think the one fortunate thing about the season being brought forward is that you don't have to go to school on the Monday because it's always a great day. <laughs> <laughs> uh, stay, up, yeah. stay up and done it. I think, stay up and I think there's, a few boys, there's a few boys still in the beer, I think, because I, I, I'm, speaking, I'm speaking from experience here when I say this, but Paul Flynn, boy, never ever tweet when you're drinking, boy. I'll tell you, and I... I be, <laughs> I've been there. I've had a few. I've had a few <laughs> close, close years. Oh, the, uh, no, he, he, got, he got some abuse, didn't he? Ah, but listen, and rightly so. Like rightly so, you know. Like, like listen, it's all right for an agent like me and for fuck's sake, like. But you know, for someone of his stature, like, and you know, even even obviously the role that he would have had in the GPA, and obviously the role that he has in the Sunday game and stuff. But they're. I'm not going to go into the Sunday game. I'm not going to go into the level of punditry, like. But unfortunately, that is the, the, the level of that you're dealing with there. Unfortunately, at the at, at the minute, like. But no, listen. I thought it was a, it was it was it was a drunken tweet. I'm sure, like you know, and he probably knows that himself. He's, I think he said there's definitely eight points in it. That's good. No, no more midnight tweets. <laughs> you can tell Flinto. You can tell Flinto if you ever talking. I'm a there. <laughs> so look, That's look good. at the the game itself. Uh, it kind of. Uh, we, it kind of worked out the way we were kind of obviously looking. We were on about this game probably two weeks before, and David was on the show last week. And we were saying, like, it kind of worked out. Dublin, as a collective unit, they had eight scores yeah. the last day. Kerry had five. Just as a collective yeah. CV, we yeah. probably felt all year that like Dublin were just that bit ahead of Kerry. I just thought end after the Division 2 final. A Division 2 final, I got a wee bit of a sort of a. They were beaten in Celtic Park, but the first half in Celtic Park, I could see little sort of small. Glimpses of their old form coming back. You know, they were leading Derry at half time quite comfortably. They dominated the, the ball, you know, and I was just thinking that Derry actually uh, turned, the, turned the second half around and beat them. But in the Division 2 final, you know, comprehensively beat Derry. Now, that was a Derry team that had no Chrissy McCaig, McAvoy, uh, Connor Glass went off on a hamstring injury as well. So you could probably argue that Derry were, 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 were reasonably under strength that day. But and uh, I just felt after the Division 2 final, I just always had a funny feeling by, you know, this crowd are not going to be that far away. The fact that they had to go to the old guard as well, you know, the, the, the old dog for the hard road, Cluxton, immense, absolutely immense. I can't even begin to describe his performance on Sunday. I was behind the goals. I was sitting up, actually, very, very fortunate, actually. Um, Kieran Quinton, player fit, actually got me a ticket for, for his, his box, actually. It was a fantastic gesture of him, but I was, I was very, very lucky to spend the day in the, in the box of player fit. And we had brilliant seats right behind the goal in the canal end. And I was just, I was leaning over the, the, the railing and it just, I was fascinated because I thought, I thought the kick-out battle was going to be, you know, a major, major player in the game. And interestingly, in the warm-up, Cluxon clipped a lot of kick-outs to the left, to his right-hand side. Now, it's Monaghan. Began came out and blocked that area in front of us. So if, if Cluxon's in the hill, for example, and he's kicking across yeah. his body to the uh, to the to the Hogan, yeah, Began Began blocked that area. So straight away, Shane Ryan was sprinting into that area to block off that area. And what Dublin actually done really discreetly and very very much at the last minute, Cluxon was looking, 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 and then he just opened the body up. Dublin would create a little mini overload in the far side, and they got the first three or four away yeah. on the far side end. But what that meant was that Kerry then had to sort of readjust their press. Then when Kerry started to drift across and negate this overload that Dublin had created, what happened in the far side was the likes of Howard was finding himself in that space. Cluxton prefers to kick across his body, yeah. you know, the, the, the draw with the left foot rather than, than the feed. And to be fair, you know, he was he was immaculate it after that. Nothing phases him. I was watching him in the second half. You know when Kerry were going hard, and you know there was there was times probably probably important not to get maybe too carried away with the statistics that he that he had twenty three out of twenty three because Kerry surprisingly dropped off a lot of kickouts. Like yeah. they, they had Dublin, they had Dublin a little bit rattled at one stage. I don't think Dublin were ever in major trouble, but they had them rattled a little bit at one stage. But then dropped off the kickout, and when you're dropping off the kickout at that level, and you're given a team like Dublin with the forwards that they have and the midfield that they have with Fenton and McCarthy. 
you're giving them a serious foothold in the game, Andy, you know, straight away. And Kerry's press against Derry is what won them the game. It was, was so impressive about them. But listen, I just felt that Dubs were streets ahead. <laughs> I, from a tactical point of view, I think I, I said it on Twitter or whatever. I thought from a tactical point of view, Dublin were right ahead, and people said, oh, they weren't men's head. I don't think people understood what I meant by that. Their kick out strategy, they nailed it on the day. Their defensive display, where they played a rotational sweeper, was fucking outstanding. The discipline that they had in their defense and their tackling. So they just, just, they just, just nailed their tactic. They nailed just their just tactic. Just go on about that, CV. We're on about the off air, the rotational uh, sweeper, because David Byrne well, was on Gainey, Fitz okay, was on so Kifford all day. Most teams and uh, most teams at club level, for example, or lower level of football, they'll play a permanent plus one. So they'll bring a forward back and they'll plant them as a sweeper, right? And we've all seen that. We've seen players that have done that. Uh, Brian Fox would have done it for Tipperary when they won the Munster Championship that year, the COVID year. You have a number of players there. Uh, McHugh, Mark McHugh would have done it for Donegal back in the in the Jim McGuinness days, right? We would have seen that. Keane O'Sullivan done it for Dublin, you know, on a regular basis. Yeah. But what Dublin was. Dublin created a sweeper, a different sweeper all the time. So it was Brian Howard, then it was Lee Gannon. At one stage in the second half, it was Kieran Kilkenny blocking off the kicking channel to, 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 to Clifford. And this takes a huge amount of on-field leadership, on-field organisation. And I just thought the rotational sweeper that Dublin produced in the final was just class. And uh, it was the Dublin of old. It was a real high level of game intelligence and a, a real, real high level of game intelligence. And it just felt that Kerry had been playing Taj Mori as a sweeper for most of the year. Yeah, They actually put Paul O'Callaghan, which was surprising. And yeah. uh, Foley, Foley went to Mannion, which, which surprised a lot of people. And I was sitting beside two Kerry folk, actually, who were quite animated about that matchup. They were quite worried about Conor Callaghan on a uh, on Taj Mori from a pace perspective, you know, and there was one there was one class moment actually in the uh second half from Con where you know that explosiveness where he got the ball and smashed it off the, the crossbar That's like you know yeah. and Con probably for his own high standards probably had a quiet game, you know. Uh, yeah. I know there's been a lot of talk about Clifford. But another That's thing too probably did go on, go on no, another thing that I felt, and from a Dublin perspective, was as well that they did drop off in the first half. So if you looked at this, if you looked at the statistics at half time, Dublin had thirty eight percent possession and Kerry at sixty two. Right, Dublin played a very, very, very uh, well disciplined counter attack and style of football. Right, and one of the things they did very well was they didn't drop too deep. Okay, they didn't drop too deep. What they did was they kept reasonable pressure on the ball out of the field. So the quality of the ball into Clifford probably wasn't at the same level as it was when they played Derry. And that was a key thing. Like people talk about Mick, Mick Fitz and how well he did. I, I don't just think it was Mick Fitz. Like Mick Fitz is a freaking warrior boy. I think he's a wonderful defender. He, he'd be the first man in your team sheet. Like he's a, he's a proper competitor. But I think that the pressure. That, that Dublin put on Kerry just higher out the field the pressure on the kicker I felt had a big big influence as well in the gate and Clifford too Andy you know yeah like they're obviously as you said the rotational sweeper CV obviously they're looking <clears throat> obviously like they're basically there's two people on Clifford at all stages I, I would assume in terms of you were at the game on telly it was it was, it was hard to see that like so that's why I was saying about because <clears throat> they're on commentary, if it's Morris, they're trying to find out, find the matchups in the first fifteen minutes. They're like, if it's Morris, it's like I actually don't know what's going on here, lads. I I'm trying to see the matchups well, here, and it was I, it was just. It was, weird. Uh, I'm trying to see the key ones, like the key ones, obviously, as we mentioned before, you know, Fitz was obviously on Clifford, uh, Davy Byrne was in, was in Guinea, uh, but then there was a sort of a, there was a, a rotational type point of view, you know, yeah. Gannon would have picked up Paulie Clifford at times, but Dublin yeah. were very, very good at rotating that plus one, you know, and, and listen, it's, it's, it's something ended that the top teams, you know, can really, it, it's, it's a huge advantage when you can manage, when the opposition don't know who your sweeper is. You know, it's a huge advantage, like, you know, from a from a, a footballer perspective, because like it's 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 a very hard thing to coach and you need very, very intelligent players and the likes of your Brian Hodge or Kieran Kilkenny's, let's not, you know, be foolish here. These are hugely <coughs> experienced players with a, with a with an extreme level, an extreme level of game intelligence, like extreme level. Well, uh, like People are going going off about the David Goff, uh, the ref, the, how he refed it on Sunday. Had you any issue with this, uh, CB, or what did you? I thought, Goff, I thought Goff. I'm not Goff's biggest fan, to be honest. With you. I think when he referees Ulster matches, uh, he throws cards out like confetti at times, like which which frustrates the people up here, I suppose. Like, but he refereed the game very well. 
But he didn't referee the game based on how he's refereed games all year, which was surprising because the way he's refereed games all year was he's been very trigger happy with the whistle. He's been very trigger happy with his cards. So I'd like to see more of that from David Goff, to be honest. I'd like to see more of that from referees right across the board. Let the fucking game flow. Let it flow, man. That's what supporters want. You know, it just added to the spectacle as well. And it wasn't a stop starting because see the weather conditions as well on Sunday. We'll watch yeah. the slippy pitch at the rest of the times. But with the extra wee bit of grease on the, on the surface from the rain, you know, there was a lot of slip. And it was a defender's dream, I suppose, you know, that he could yeah. get close to a forward, get a hand in. You know, at the same time, it was high risk as well. If a defender slipped, the forward was in. But referee the game. Just just referee it. Like. But I thought, listen, I thought Goff did well. And there's no point in, you know, credit where credit's due. There's no point in trying to define, you know, something. Listen, and uh, Kerry were beat. Kerry were beat, right? If you speak to 100 Kerry fans outside the ground, 99 of them will have an issue with Goff. Right, let's be honest. Dublin won, no issue with Goff. Dublin are beat. Dublin fans are being gossed back. You know, that's just the fickle nature of sport and football, you know, <coughs> the team. But from, from a neutral perspective, which I was, I felt that, that, that Goff refereed the game very well, to be honest with you, you know. Uh, the reason I got onto Goff there was because obviously there's been a, uh, James McCarthy, you know, in the beginning he had a, had a, a kind of thing on the Sunday game saying, you know, they found, Dublin found that line a bit better than Kerry and they pushed it. Now, it's oh, it's hindsight. That's great. All I'm going to say that. But McCarthy, I I I saw on telly it was probably four, if not five, kind of uh, yellow card uh, fences that he could have got. He was lucky, in my opinion, Stevie. He was very lucky to be honest. To, to yeah. Stay on the pitch. Yeah. And uh, um, and there would and there would be and there would be well qualified in in uh, speaking about teams going to the line. Anyway, when you think of him throwing teams that he played in. <laughs> like, <laughs> On a serious note, he, he's got a very valid point because you always sort of you just put your toe across the line, and you know you would, yeah. from a coaching perspective, like you would be saying to teams, you know, you'd be saying to your players, look, go to the line, but maybe just don't cross it. And if you do cross it, bring your bring your foot back pretty quickly and just see what you can get away with. And I know Mickey Hart would have described some referees as as nearly, you know, allowing the three quarter foul as he called it. Like, and it was it was a, it was an interesting description. You know, where some referees will allow the three quarter foul. Now, what, what does he mean by that? He means that he'll probably just you'll get away with a bit more physical contact. You'll get away with a bit more hands on the body because technically the definition of the tackle in the GA rulebook is to make in contact with the ball. You know, so now you'll also get you'll also get referees who won't allow any contact and who'll referee the game in a very trigger happy way. And uh, and I just don't think it leads to a good spectacle. You know, so. I, I would have been very content from a neutral perspective that, that, you know, that the referee the referee was very good. The McCarthy incidents, they're going to happen. Let's be honest. If you scrutinise every single game and every single incident, you'll find something in there. You'll find something somewhere. Or you'll find, you know, you'll find, a, I think, like, for example, when Lee Gannon ran into, uh, was it Taj Morley? Did he yeah. run into Taj Morley? And, oh, and Goff came in and waved away the, the Dublin physio and doctor yeah. uh, who, who who who, are, who oh, back in the day? Who back in the day? Ryan, Ryan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they had game management to a different level, boy. They were blocking yeah, off yeah. running. Channels. But but uh, but Gannon Gannon got you know he got straight up straight away and he went with you know, so like look there was there's always contentious issues in any game of football. But no, I I thought he was okay. I thought he was yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, no, that was look that was probably I I probably sensed that if it wasn't James McCarthy and the stature he holds in the game. If it was anyone else, you know, I'd be kind of thinking they, they could have been in trouble. But maybe it was the fact that going for the nine, obviously, 13, 14 year Dublin, obviously, legend and all that. Maybe that would have came into into his mind. But um, no, apart from, no, I, I agree with you, Stevie. I thought, thought Goff let it flow. And in, I know myself, and you know this as well. Obviously, when, when Crow Park gets greasy like that. It was drizzling a lot of the day. Uh, it was pissing rain at halftime, I heard. So uh, when it's conditions like that, it is hard to ref uh, a game like that. And um, In fairness to the two teams, um, look, at, let's, let's, let's call a spade a spade here. You know, Clux and Mannion, Mannion was interviewed after the, <clears throat> after the game and I think Damien Lorna basically said, like, you know, the three boys coming back, coming back uh, this year, you know, seeing Dublin's all Ireland victory and obviously Paul being... I mean, I'm quite modest. He just, you know, he's just basically, you know, no, like that's not not the case, like. But it, it, it's clear as day, Stephen, that you know, as you said there, Cluxton, Cluxton hasn't taken a free, I'd say, for say in ten years. 
He is strapping. He's his knee. His knee joint obviously is at him. He's strapping on his knee. His his left Save kicking it. foot. So it's to, for like <clears throat> to say that you know I would you know it's just incredible in fairness to him in terms of a guy. Uh, the first free, the first free end was magnificent, magnificent. Yeah. You know, yeah. I was at a forty-five. Was the first it was a forty-five. Uh, it was. It was, it was, I, I was either free, but they were from forty-five yards out. It was. It was magnificent. He, it was, it was unbelievable, you know, the experience and and, and that. But the calm and influence probably as well. I, I just couldn't believe how, you know, the calmness of him in the second half. But I would say the influence that he has in the change rooms, I yeah. said the respect. I would say the levels of respect that he has. Look, you, you could probably go as far as saying he, he probably carries the same equal amount of respect as the manager, which is very unusual in the changing room, if not more. <laughs> you know? yeah, yeah. And, which is which is hugely unusual in a changing room, but a, a, a figure of his personality, stature, you know, and, and experience having been around you, for, for you can, well, you, can even, you, you can even know though, see in terms of after the game and the cameras call he was you know, people were hugging Cluxton, but I I I'd, I'd agree with you there. I like in terms of the standards, he probably came in, everyone was on basically mouthing that, you know, it's the right move and we were saying this on the pod, like, yeah, I was saying he's going to start, like, Stephen Cluxton is not going to come back and just go sitting on the bench here. He's, he's definitely going to start here. So, like, I would say, as you said, that them standards that they've set um, in the last 12, 13 years, as you said, he, he, he would probably hold similar status as the, as the manager. And, he, like, he is, you see, it's, obviously he's the guy that gets the playoff again. Like, they come in and, you know, if even the one thing that did surprise me, though, Stephen, is, he did go long, right, the first half, two or three times, and they overloaded and they got the break. But then, mm -hmm. so uh, I think someone came in, Stephen, and said to, to go shorter. That's something I, mm -hmm. I didn't understand in terms of, I, you know, in, they're winning the long run. So why, why do they... Why did they go go short the after couple, that? The couple of long ones, the couple of long ones that they did went under the Cusick stand in the first half, yeah. though they, they were quite fortunate. They did break to them, you know, and it could easily have broke their carry player. There was yeah. one in particular that broke, you know. Uh, but look, Dublin as well, like you know, four or five times in the second half, Dublin went with a bunch and break. Carry went man to man again. I I, I don't see for a, to have a keeper like Cluxton and a team that bunched and breaks in the space like. It's just a gift. It's nearly like a family kick to no goalkeeper in nets, you know. Yeah. Like, look, he's just clipping the ball out effortlessly. He's done that probably a hundred and fifty times in training that week. You know, he's, he's so. But funny you say about the knee. I seen a photograph after the match with it, where the bit of the strapping was, the bit of the strapping was off the knee, and the knee looked in bits, absolute bits, like you know, the, the left knee looked in, in, in ribbons, like. But it's an interesting one about Mannion, how fresh Mannion looked and, and how good Mannion was. When you think about this. Right, Mannion missed Kill McCuds All Ireland campaign yeah. in uh, 2020, 2022 when when Kilcoo won the All Ireland. Right, Mannion missed that whole campaign. Their best player. Right, the following year uh, in 2023 when they got when they won the All Ireland this year. Sorry, he also missed the majority of their campaign and didn't yeah. play at all. It was Shane Walsh that, that obviously was was the big factor for them. So Mannion actually has had two serious ankle injuries and his problem mm. and. Uh, with a serious thirst and a serious hunger as well, because he's probably missed those last couple of big occasions with this club, you know. Yeah. And I would say yeah. hunger as well was back, you know. Jack McCaffrey, I think Jack is just he's just very, very evident that he's he's a good character to have around the Chasers because a lot of the Dublin team obviously have this very, very serious picture and very serious image and, you know, carry themselves in a very you know, mundane matter. It's it's all the guards always up. Whereas Jack seems to be that sort of character that could fucking float in ten minutes late and probably get away with it. Do you know what I mean? Like, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Not, not every player, know. not every player get away with that now, Stevie. No, no. But but if you listen to the story of Jim Gavin where he talks about he missed training on the Tuesday night before the All Ireland final. You know, a couple of years ago when he was working late as a doctor and he rang Jim and not make it. You know, and still played like you know. So he obviously is a very very popular character in the Chasers. But he had a, people probably didn't really give him the respect. Uh, that the influence he had on the game on Sunday when he came in and the like he had a massive positive influence for Dublin he was massive positive in the body final as well he's some option to come off the bench right? some Huge. option to come in off I look it's like we especially, said this, when a team, especially when a team is starting to fatigue you know yeah well look I suppose 
Uh, you would have been a brave man. It was it was evident generally. It was one eleven apiece after sixty one minutes, Stevie. So you would have been a brave man. But it was it was very evident that the two teams literally took a break for thirty seconds. They kind of Dublin just played around the ball. The two teams were out in their feet. So that's no. It came it and I said that I said those exact words to the guy beside me. I said both those teams by are on the ropes, like from a physical point of view. But I think you know obviously the emotional energy and stuff that would have been consumed. In it, but but I'm gonna say this to you, right? I still didn't think Dublin were going to lose the game ever. I never had that feeling. I've always been, I've been in a lot of matches where you thought, "Fuck, Mayo nearly had them, or Sutton nearly had them." I just didn't feel Kerry were going to win that game. I don't know why, but I just felt Dublin. Even when they went three points down, there was no panic. There was no fucking stress. There was no work. You know, I just I just felt now they got a bit of a break with the goal, and people are, are pointing at that. But Kerry still went three points up after that goal. Do you know what I mean? You know, I, I, I thought Kerry tactically, and this is where I where I had the, the, the whole argument with a, with a number of people about this. I still think Kerry tactically got it wrong. And that's the bottom line. I think late in the game, when they when they went the three points up, there was a chance to really put a fucking aggressive press on, get the foot on the game. But they dropped off every kick out in it. They dropped off every kick out. And they invited Dublin back into the game. You know, and like Kerry were one of the very first teams to ever go after Cluxon ever go after him. Everyone was afraid to go after him. You know, and I was just, I was expecting so much more from Kerry. Was, I thought was, they were very was, passive in their hands. Very was, passive. Was Shane, was Shane Ryan coming out on the kickouts, uh, Stevie, at all? Did Shane Ryan come out for Kerry at all? For Cookson's kickouts? Did he press, did he, he come out to pitch at all? He played, he played in the space, in the pocket in the first half. He played in the pocket. Did he? First half, yeah. 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 Okay. But it, never um, seemed, and it, it just didn't end. It just didn't seem... Like a proper press, you know, it didn't yeah. really. I never, I never really got the, I never really got the, you know, the impression. I took a couple of wee videos from behind the goals and a couple of still photos, and I never got the impression that Kerry were really going after them. I never really got that impression, you know. Well, 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 do you think that? Do you think that's a fact, though? We said the like Derry obviously ran through the lot in the first half. The carrier, they're, they're nearly afraid to press though, because uh, you know, if if you get. If you get the wrong side of that CV, you're open. That transition is quick. And w- would it be a case that Jack was like, they got stuck between two stools here? Is like, oh, yeah, we're going for the full press, but watch. You know, well, watch. I, would say, I would say there was an element. There's, there's probably a lot of scar tissue from 2021 where Tyrone went over the top of their press, uh, you know, and scored goals against them. And like Kerry have a guy working for them from the Tully Siren Club in Armagh called Colin Trainer. Uh, Colin is a statistical genius when it comes to crunching numbers and a lot of these teams are now stats driven and okay a lot of the top teams are now the numbers are crunched here's where we get our gains here's where we get our gains okay so when they're crunching numbers and they're looking at their kickouts they're probably looking and probably getting more of a reward from dropping off kickouts and they're probably conceding less so when they press the position, they're maybe conceding more. And those are probably the things that, that, that are probably dictating why teams are doing that now, you know. So it is very, very, the game's become very artistically driven, you know. Uh, just just looking from the, the, the score, it was kind of like, look at Durham, like obviously Clifford, David Clifford, you know, his high standards. I still thought he had a very good game. Uh, obviously set up the goal. He had his hand probably in one five one six, but obviously... You know, people are accustomed to him scoring seven, eight, nine points out at this stage. So, you know, three points and uh, they got, you know, the, the, the pass for Danny's goal was an absolute peach, I have to say. My Unbelievable. gosh. Unbelievable. His vision, he his had, vision is a, along the end line. It was class. Absolutely class. Yeah, like literally five, five yards, Jim. And Ganey, in fairness, um, the finish, the composure, the double, it wasn't a double half. Uh, obviously, the rule book, if you flick it up with your foot the second time, it's not, it's not, a, it's not considered a half. So, the composure by Ganey, look, they got a big game out of Ganey, Stevie. Like, you know, Kerry, Kerry did get, you know, games out, we say. Um, obviously, 1 1 from Ganey. Shawnee, Shawnee Shea probably he had five, four for, uh, five points, four from freeze. Probably from play, didn't do enough uh, in terms of they needed a bit more off him. Paulie Clifford had a good game. He stepped up big time, especially 20 minutes in the second half. He had three points in the trot within about 10 minutes, I'd say. And uh, yeah. James Bland, when he came on, uh, scored an absolute peach. First touch of the ball. He, he, so they did, you know, I suppose they needed. The big thing for me before this game, Stephen, was probably you look through, we say, the halfbacks up until the full forward line on both teams, and you're going through each individual, and you're thinking to yourself, right, he he he's a good chance of scoring here. He he gets on the score sheet a fair bit. 
or you go through the Dublin and Kerry team, you're going to say a lot more Dublin players are more likely to get a point or two than you are in terms of the Kerry players, in terms of the history would, you know, would tell you that, you know, they just aren't prolific when it comes to getting a point or two like. I was sitting beside a couple of hardcore Kerry fans. They knew their football and they were very, very staunch Kerry supporters by, by, by listening and speaking to them. You get criticised for talking about the lack of strength and depth maybe that they had this year, the fact that they haven't unearthed any new talent. I've said in the show all year, take Clifford out and they're bang average, right? And I really, really still insist that that is the case, right? I think they've got some brilliant, brilliant footballers, but I'm talking about and uh, separating that real elite level, you know, to those <laughs> top two or three teams. And I think if you were to take Clifford out of Kerry, Kerry come back to the middle bunch of top eight teams in the country that I would call the likes. Kerry would come back to the likes of your Armas, your Tyrones, very, very quickly, and Very, very quickly, if you were to take David Clifford out of that team. He's a superstar. He's a wonderful footballer. I think some of the criticism that's been levelled at him over the last few days has been absolutely embarrassing. Uh, he's the captain of the county. He's a young man. Uh, they had a terrible bereavement this year as well, and their family as well, with the tragic loss of his mother. You know, he's carrying the burden and the weight of a county, and on his shoulders. And actually, the question, some of the stuff that's been fired at him over the last few days has been absolutely appalling, and to be honest with you, absolutely I'm appalling. Like, just, and and even, just, even, the stuff, even the stuff, I don't know, we, we joked about it at the start about Paul Flynn, like, but, you know, to be talking about getting smoked, and, you know, using language like he was smoked, like, what a load of bullshit. Like, like the man is, is an absolute superstar in the GA. For me, David Clifford is the best marketing tool in the GA that we have, right? So I'm going to give you a prime example, Linda. Today, in, in my school here, Nuri St. Joseph's, we ran a little coaching camp, right? And we had Amy Mackin in, who's one of the top lady footballers in the country, Arma. We had McGeary in, who was Football of the Year a few years ago. Uh, we had Mark Doran, who was coaching Clare this year. We had all the men coaching, the youngsters. First question you said to any young player, name me a top player in the country. And the first question, the first answer they'll give you back is, David Clifford, what's so good about him? He can kick off both feet, Stevie. What's what's brilliant about it? He, he is actually inspiring a completely new generation of Gaelic footballer. He is the best marketing tool we have, you know. And 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 like it was an absolute sin when you think that RTE had Kerry, the All Ireland champions, on their television once this year. When we have a proper modern day GA superstar, he's not on social media. He doesn't crave media attention. He he's got a, a partner. He's got a child. You know, he's, he's a good guy. He seems to have a real good way about himself. I just think he's an unbelievable talent. And I think he's a fantastic role model. And he's a superstar for these young people coming through at the minute, you know. Yeah, look, it's like when you <laughs> when someone's at the top, Stevie, people just love to bring him, bring the, that person back yeah. down. Uh, simple as that. And look, at for his, he's incredibly high standards. Uh, and... Look, I suppose I will say this: Dublin did a very good job of scarfing him uh, possession, and I know as a corner forward, he was probably thinking, you know, when he got on that ball, especially in the second half, he was trying to force things in terms of taking shots yeah. that probably taking shots that he probably and they're for him they're probably still a high percentage shot, but they're still a very difficult shot. Um, yeah. But look, look, Dublin did a really good job of scaring him with the ball, and he was trying to when he got on the ball. Then obviously he was trying to force things just a wee bit, and even the goal, uh, Goff called called uh, called it back for a free. Um, but he he blasted wide, and even for like for him that you know usually that's not his, his composure. He's not he's much more composed usually in them situations. So I look at as a collective. Look, Fitz did a did a, a good job on him, but let's let's not. Let's not kid ourselves here. It was as a collective rotational sweepers coming back. Mind the Mannion. Huh? I, but outside of Mannion, outside of Mannion and Cluxton, you know, for me, yeah. there wasn't really a man a mad amount of standout performances in the final. No. Nobody really played that well. You know, no. it was a defender's dream. It was a real dogged game. It wasn't a day for 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 classy forwards. Whereas last year, on a beautiful sunny day in Crow Park, we kicked 10, 11 points against Galway. Shane Moss kicked nine, you know, so like, yeah. you know, it was a forwards day last year, it was a defender's day this year, and that's the yeah. way it is, that's football, you know. 100%, 100%, man, 100%.